in NLP. So what we're going to want to do is say, we're going to want to build a model that gives a score to a sequence of words and also give it a score to our corrupted sequence of words. And what we're going to ask is that the score for the good sequence is bigger. So then the question is, well, how do we calculate that score? Well, the way we're going to do it is with our neural network, where we've associated each word with a dense vector representation. And well, where do those dense vector representations come from? We're going to start with a matrix, which is size, size of the vocabulary, and then the dimensionality of our neural embedding, say 100. And we're just going to initialize this vector of this matrix randomly. And then what we're going to do is have our model learn in an unsupervised way what is a good representation for words. So this matrix is often called the lookup table because you can think of it that if you start off with a one-hot vector, you can then pre-multiply the one-hot vector by this matrix and you'll get out the representation for each word, where that's just a complex way of saying that you're selecting the right column of this matrix. Okay, so then, well, if we suppose we have a representation for each word, how do we then learn this score for a phrase? So if we have a sequence of words, each has its representation, what we're going to do is just concatenate um, the word representations to have a long vector as the representation for the phrase. And that's what we're then going to have to score. OK, so how do we do that? Well, remember, the single layer of the neural network is, first of all, doing the dot, dot product and then passing through the non-linearity. Then we're going to take the output of that, which is a vector, and then we're going to score it for goodness. And the scoring for goodness is going to be done by multiplying it by another vector, which is then going to give us output a real number. OK, so to summarize that once more, so to compute the score with this three-layer neural network, we take the words, we do the lookup to get the neural representation of this word subsequence. We run it through a single neural network layer um, to get an output. We multiply the output by another vector, and then that gives us the score. OK. So then the idea for our training objective is that we're going to want to say we want the score of true windows to be significantly larger than the score of bad windows. And so the idea here is this is a large margin training objective. That we're going to want to say that um, we're wanting to ask for having a significantly better score over here um, for the good one or else we incur a loss. Now, obviously, having this max in here um, means that it's not a differentiable function, but it is still a continuous function that we can run SGD over. OK, so this is our function that we want to um, optimize. This is how the score is worked out um, for the good and the corrupted word. And let's assume a case where the cost is greater than 0. So if the cost is just a 0, which is meaning that the score of the good sequence is already significantly higher in our model, then there's nothing that our model needs to learn. So we don't need to do anything. So if the cost is greater than 0, well, what we need to do is we then are going to compute the derivatives of everything with respect to all of the variables, u, w, v, and x. And that will then give us the gradient, which we can then use to learn with with either stochastic gradient descent or other methods. So concretely, how does one do that? Well, if we look at the derivative of the score, because this whole thing is just um, the sum of two scores, well, if we take the derivative of one score with respect to our u vector, or variables in our u vector, which is the ultimate scoring vector, um, that's super simple um, derivative. So the, the derivative with respect to a u variable is just going to be a, what is the um, current output, what is the current output of our model. So that's very easy to calculate. Let's go on and look at the other derivatives. So suppose we want to calculate the derivative of a particular weight, an element of our weight matrix in the neural network. So for example, this weight 2, 3. 
Well, the first thing to notice is that that weight 2, 3 only feeds into being multiplied by u2 in the final part of computing the score. Okay, so therefore, if we take the derivative of the score with respect um, to w, we can kind of just head down that path for an individual w. So let's look at the steps of that. Um, so the derivative of the score is the derivative of uta. Um, so for the derivative of weight ij, that's just the derivative of ui ai, because that's the only place where weight ij is going to appear. Um, then we can bring the ui up the front because it's a constant with respect to weight ij. And so then we have to work out the derivative of ai with respect to w and ij. And then ai is then um, being the result of f of z. So then we want to work out the derivative of this f of z. And at this point, we need to remember a teeny bit of calculus, but only a teeny bit of calculus. So effectively, we just need to use the chain rule. So we take, need to take the derivative of f of z. So that's going to be the derivative of f times, with respect to um, z, times the derivative of the inside z with respect to wij. So this derivative of f is going to be the derivative of a logistic function. And that's something that we just know. Um, so we head on down from that. And now we want to take the derivative of z. And so z is just the output of our linear layer, the dot product here. And so we're going to work on that, which happens on the next slide. So the derivative of the linear layer, well, there's only one term in that in which wij is mentioned. And so it's just going to be xj. And so what we end up at the end is two terms. Here's our xj, which is the local input signal that we put into w23. And then we have the local error signal, which is then being calculated um, here in terms of what's up above, really. That fits in terms of the i variable on the output of the network. OK, so that's the derivative with respect to just a single weight. If we want to work out the derivatives with respect to all of the W variables, i.e. the whole weight matrix, we just do the same thing again and again. And every one of them is, is of the same form, delta i times xj. And so we want to work out all combinations of that. And so that's effectively then equivalent to working out this outer product, where we're taking the outer product of um, the delta i vector and the xj vector. So we're making a matrix that has the respective terms of those all multiplied together. And so that's then giving us this responsibilities of each term and the local activations. Um, for the bias variables, it's essentially the same story. If you think of the bias variable as being equivalent to having an always on plus one unit, you get exactly what you'd expect because x is always one, and so its derivative is just the same delta i quantity. Okay, um, so that's almost all that happens um, for back propagation. It's simply going through working out the derivatives using the chain rule. There's one final trick um, to producing um, efficient um, back propagation algorithms. And that's the, the idea of just reusing partial computation that we're all familiar with. Um, so that what we do is we can reuse quantities calculated for derivatives of higher layers and use them again in lower layers. And so an example of that is for working out the derivatives of the word vectors. Um, so the really interesting part of these models is as well as changing the W weights, we can also backpropagate our errors into the word representations. And so we'll also update the word representations. And that's precisely how we're then learning these unsupervised word representations that will be so useful. So if you work out um, the derivative of our score with respect um, to the word representation. I think I'll leave out going through the details of the math because Joshua is going to talk about the principles of it immediately after me. Uh, but if we just skip down to the bottom, what you see is that you actually end up with this exactly the same delta term where you've got the ui times the derivative of f times 
on calculated on the linear term. So this same quantity is used exactly the same again, and so you can make use of it multiple times. Okay. Um, so that's the idea of how you train these word vectors. Let me just close by saying, well, what is the big advantage of these learned word vectors compared to other ways of coming up with vector space representations of words? And it is the fact that we can embed, we can build bigger deep learning models, which at the top have some supervisory information. And we can use that label information to propagate down to our word representation useful supervisory information for a task. And so remember, right at the beginning, we started off with our accent model, which was our supervised learning predicting classes. Well, what we can do is we can stick precisely that model as a soft, as a soft max layer on top of our neural network. So now we've got our word representations going to a hidden layer and then projecting to a soft max layer onto our classification decision. And so then we'll be able to use any supervisory data available to us to project down onto improved word representations for that task. And that gives us an enormous ability to have the benefits of using supervision as well as using unsupervised learning. Okay, I'm officially done. All right, so now let's move into uh, a little bit more detail of, of the back part uh, uh, and uh, the chain rule. So, first of all, a uh, reminder, we want to compute gradients of the loss for one example or for uh, a mean back of examples with respect to all parameters, and we can use that for optimization, say, stochastic gradient descent or something. And the basic uh, principle we're going to use is the chain rule. But what does the chain rule say? It, it tells us what to do when we're composing functions. And this is typically what we want to do in deep learning, we're composing functions. So, use this. so if, uh, if, say, x uh, is transformed by function g and we get y, and then y is transformed by function f and we get z, uh, then the chain rule tells us how a change in x influences z as dz dy times dy dx. There's another thing we learn about in the next few slides, which is that if you're computing uh, some function like the loss, the, the one example or two examples against some parameters, and that computation can be done in order of n, then computing the gradient can also be done in order of n. So we'll see how that arises. So let's say we have some input x, and I'm going to construct a graph where each node uh, represents the result of a computation, and each arc represents a dependency. In other words, you know that to compute y, I need first to know x, and I'm going to apply some function. Then let's say we have the same graph as before, so x influences y, which influences z. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to associate each of the arcs partial derivatives. And now it's time to understand what these partial, partial derivatives mean. Well, here's what they mean. If I make a small infinite, infinite little change in y, delta y, I'm going to get a change in z, delta z. And there's a scalar that relates these two changes, which is dz dy. So dz dy tells, tells us how a change in y translates linearly as a change in z. And the same thing for x, uh, a delta x change is transformed into a delta y change using dy dx. Now let's plug this definition of delta y into this one. Substitute this delta y, we get this line. This line tells us that a small change in x translates as a small change in z as dz dy times dy dx which is essentially saying this, that dz dx is dz dy times dy dx. So I've just proven for you the chain rule, but I want you to understand what is going on. It's essentially we're trying to compute the influences of small changes in one place of the graph on other places. Now let's complicate matters a little bit by having 
two y's here, y1 and y2, and two pathways from x to z through these two paths, these two variables. So now instead of just uh, uh, this derivative times this derivative, we get going to sum the contributions coming for each of the two paths. And we get uh, a more general form of the chain rule. And we can generalize that to having uh, n different intermediate variables, y1 to yn. And then we get a sum of the uh, gradients to all the paths. And you can think of it as, uh, to get the gradient with respect to x, I need these at the x. I can, I, if I, I can do it if only I knew how to compute the gradients on the successors of x, y1, y, y1 to n. So if I already knew dz dy i, I can get dz dx by multiplying these guys, which I can store on these nodes, by the partial derivative associated to the arcs. So this is exactly what we're going to do. And we can do it in a more general setting of a, an arbitrary graph, which we call a flow graph, where again, each node is, is the result of a computation. And, uh, and uh, let's say again the y1 to yn are the successors of my variable x, then I'm going to be able to express the partial derivative of some scalar final output node, like the loss, with respect to my variable x, as the sum over all the successors of the gradients already computed for the successors, dz dy i times dy i dx. So this is the same formula. Now let's apply this in. Uh, multi layered beyond that, as we've seen earlier. So we have some inputs uh, y, some target y, for example, some inputs x, some target y, some parameters b, and let's say we compute uh, a bunch of neuron output with uh, your hyperbolic tangent instead of the sigmoid, which uh, is essentially uh, the same. We can do the same thing for a second layer, and now we, uh, let's say we have a neural net which computes output probabilities for different classes uh, using the softmax formalism uh, that Chris has shown. Okay, so we take these probabilities and uh, we have the, we know what the correct class was. So the loss is going to be the log likely or the negative log likely because, because we want to minimize it. So that's minus the log of the output corresponding to the correct class. So we look up in this vector the one corresponding to the correct y, and that's the thing we want to minimize. So how are we going to do that? Uh, the backdrop phase is going to compute gradients, starting at the output node, <coughs> the gradient with respect to this output node. So this is going to be like the z I had in my previous slide. And uh, I'm going to apply the, the chain rule so that at each node, we look up the successors and compute the derivative of NLL with respect to each of the nodes in this way. So I can do it for the outputs, and then I, once I have the gradients for these guys, and compute the gradients for these guys, which are my parameters, so those I, I really care about. And then I can compute the gradients with respect to those guys, the hidden units, and so on. And I could also do it for, for these guys, but I don't need them, so I'm not going to compute them for the goal. So now we can generalize that to any kind of computation. We've done it for a uh, regular one hidden layer neural you know net, but we can do it for any graph. So here's the general, the, the completely general algorithm. Any computation you want to do that ends up into a scalar, and we want to compute the derivative of that scalar with respect to all of the nodes or any of the nodes in the graph. We're going to have two phases to this computation. First phase is computing the outputs of each node, and second phase is going to be computing the gradients of the final scalar output with respect to each of the nodes. In the first phase, we call it f prop or forward propagation, and the second phase, back prop or backward propagation. So in f prop, we're going to go in the graph in an order that makes sense, that is the topological sort uh, which preserves uh, sort of the, uh, you know, you can only compute this guy after you've seen all of its predecessors. Same thing for all the nodes. So we do that. We get the output. So we, we're done with computing uh, what we care about, the output, the loss. And then we start the second phase. In the second phase, we're going to uh, apply this recursion, the same rule I've shown before. Uh, but we have to initialize recursion. So the way we can initialize is we can set dz dz v1, which is of course always true. And then we can we can look at the nodes below, and we're going to compute uh, using the same recursion. Now, of course, for these nodes, probably going to be only one successor, so this is going to be a very simple one. But still, we can apply the same recipe for all the nodes, going down in reverse order. Uh, 
uh, compared to the order we, we uh, used in the first phase. And that's it. So you can compute gradients for any, uh, any graphing, any computation. And you can see by this process that uh, the computation I'm doing for computing the gradients are just kind of a kind of transpose of what I've known for computing the loss, which is a way of proving that if I, if I have order of n computation to compute the loss, then I get order of n computation to compute uh, the gradients. In fact, you can make that uh, computation of the gradients completely automatic using automatic differentiation, and there are a number of, of tools out there that can do that. I'll mention at the end uh, a library that, that we've written called Theano. Uh, and in fact, so you can use uh, code that will take a, a symbolic representation of your computation, like basically a program or an expression, a symbolic expression that does the computation if you were to run numbers into it. And you can take that and compute another graph which, uh, which would compute the gradients. And that's very useful for debugging and, and prototyping and, and, and avoiding uh, problems in uh, manual errors of computing the derivatives. All right, so let's um, look at an application of this uh, in the models that Florida and Weston and, and their collaborators later have used for particular power speech uh, tagging and, and name and 